On this episode of Coffee with Cornelius, we are talking about one of the biggest mysteries in economic history. Why did the Industrial Revolution occur in Britain? Scholars have a variety of explanations, cheap coal, culture, political institutions, even genetics are popular ones. My guest today suggests that it's mainly to do with an improving mentality among Britain's innovators, a frame of mind which allowed men and women to see room for improvement. These innovators became evangelists for this mindset, spreading it like a wildfire across the island nation. My guest is Anton Howes, historian in residence at the Royal Academy of Arts and head of innovation research at the Entrepreneurs Network, a think tank. Dr. Howe received his PhD from King's College London in 2016 and has taught at King's College and Brown University in the United States. He is the author of the book Arts and Minds, How the Royal Society of Arts Changed a Nation from Princeton University Press and is currently writing a book on British innovations from 1547 to 1851. Anton, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, what got you interested in the history of innovation? Basically, I was interested in economic growth. I was interested in why it is that some societies have become much richer than others. And originally, I was just going to look at Britain in the Industrial Revolution as a case study, one of many where, you know, I'd look at the Soviet Union versus, you know, the West in terms of innovation and territorial development in the 20th century. Increasingly, I got obsessed. So originally, I guess it was going to be the chapter of my thesis on the Industrial Revolution, and that turned into the whole thing. And then originally I was going to look at the inventors alongside a whole host of other things for one chapter. And then eventually that turned into you know, the, entire, the entire project. And now I guess I've found myself steeped in history of invention, history of innovation, um, partly because I think it is the most important thing that we need to look at. Was that something that was engendered during your undergrad or in high school? Was that something that just caught your fancy in, in the PhD? Around the time I was considering my PhD, a bit of exposure to some economic history was what got me thinking, okay, in inventors and innovators seem to be an exciting field to look into. And also a field where I felt like there was a lot of work that kind of looked at inventors from a very macro point of view, sort of bird's eye, looking at Britain as though, you know, it either has a, some kind of culture of invention, which is a very broad, sweeping statement, or the inventors are simply responding to incentives. You know, I was reading Robert Allen in my first year, um, or it's, you know, certain restrictions, cultural restrictions are lifted, and so inventors are starting to ha have a go. Reading McKeer in that first year as well, um, where there's this emphasis on institutions. Um, and I guess I was convinced by that case. Um, and so a lot of my work, I feel, builds upon that. Um, but now more broadly, you know, the more I look into sp the lives of specific inventors, specific innovators, um, I guess the more interesting it becomes, because the more fine-grained the story becomes, some of the macro stories appear to start to break down a bit. It's always, I guess, the problem with historians is they'll always kind of turn around whenever you come up with any kind of good theory in the game. It's actually a bit more complicated than that, or they'll say, well, maybe there's a little bit more nuance we need to pay attention to here. Yeah, that is true. I mean, I think the purpose of a theory, though, is just to give you a kind of a map. And then if you deviate from that map, then fine, right? But uh, the question really is to what extent is the map accurate? Now, for those of, of us who don't know, can you tell us, can you define what is the Industrial Revolution? I think that's a really good question to ask, because it's sort of the question you need to ask at the beginning of any discussion of the Industrial Revolution. And it's kind of funny that we even use the term, because I I think pretty much everyone since the 1940s who's written a book about it starts that book by saying, this is a terrible term and I didn't use it and I wish we yeah. had some <laughs> other thing to call it. Because when, when you say industrial revolution, right, you think, okay, children in factories, children going up chimneys, children, you know, down the mines, you think maybe, okay, it's like this Dickensian vision of the world. It's factories, it's coal, it's steam, it's cotton. Uh, it's iron, it's, you know, locomotive trains. And that's just not what a lot of the debate is actually about, right? A lot of the time the debate is about um, a much broader sweep of changes that happens across pretty much every industry in the 18th century. And actually increasingly in my in the 17th century is where a lot of the actions seems to be taking place. Um, that Britain actually by 1700 not by 1800, not by 1850, but by 1700 is already the place where um, it has an international reputation for improvement. Um, 
within the rest of Europe and also and I've, I've started looking into perspectives from even further afield where you know Asian visitors to, 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 to Europe and to Britain are coming and saying oh, there's something going on here um, in the early 18th century so when we say industrial revolution I think the problem is we, we start to, to mix effects of certain changes um, with the causes of those changes mm -hmm. um, and actually a lot of the debate about what counts as the industrial revolution is actually kind of the subtext there is that it's about what we think is important for its causes right so if I thought that um, empire was important um, I'm probably going to date the beginning of the industrial revolution from the beginning of the empire if sure. I think that coal is important I'm going to date it from savory or Newcomen steam engine or maybe mm -hmm. Watts engine in the 1760s. If I think cotton's important, I'm probably going to date, give it the traditional 1760 to 1830s kind of. For me, I start to, what I'd like to do, um, which I will be doing in this book, is kind of saying, I'm not going to use this term. Or if I am going to use the term British Industrial Revolution, what I really mean is, I mean the acceleration of innovation. This kind of okay. across every single industry, and even broader than it, just think about industries. A lot of the people who I'm studying, these, these improvers, these inventors, they're not just improving technology in the sense where if I say inventor you probably think machinery right I'm thinking these are people who are also coming up with new dance routines uh, for country dancing who are coming up with ways to improve uh, the way that kids when they're doing their choir practice should learn the latest psalms right oh. these are these are people who are applying this way of improving stuff to basically anything and everything and what, when they say improvement, I mean, that's really a subjective thing as to what counts as an improvement, right? Sometimes that's about greater beauty and design, which can be a very subjective thing also in itself, um, as well as greater efficiency, as well as making things cheaper, right? So improvement and this acceleration of innovation, as I, as I, as I think, is the, the, a much better way of calling it. I mean, I've even been so bold as to capitalise it in the first draft of my manuscript. I hope that this will be a thing that takes off a bit more because I'm not really interested in, in the causes of the factory system. That's a byproduct. That just happens to be one of the many inventions mm. that came out of it. The same with you know, uh, Arkwright's uh, machinery, the same with John Cates' flying shuttle, and this, the same with Bolton and Watts' steam engine. Now, you uh, kind of... I guess sidestep that in a way, and you talk about innovation. Your main thesis coming book is that there was an improving mentality among British peoples, an improving mentality which impelled them to innovate. Is this just a tautology though? What I'm asking really is, don't innovative people have an innovative mindset by definition? What I'm really asking is, 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 a, is a question of definition. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. And it's a good question because actually that's not the assumption of a lot of other people when they look at causes of invention, mm -hmm. right? And actually behind a lot of economists' yeah. assumptions about innovation is just get the incentives right and everyone can become That is true. The institutions right? or McCloskey's, whatever. Yeah. Or behind McCloskey's bourgeois dignity thesis is lift the constraints, people have a go, right? So, yeah. So either it's about lowering um, entry entry barriers, lowering costs, or it's about improve, or it's about just kind of getting the incent monetary incentives. Or, and uh, occasionally you get social incentives coming into it. I think with some people who are coming at it with a bit more nuance. But actually, most people think of invention as always having been amongst the choice set. Mm -hmm. But actually, I don't think that's true. You know, uh, so my favorite, one of my favorites so is... Just, just to be clear, here. just to be clear, the economist view is something like if you make the patent system more uh, rigid, not rigid necessarily, but more able to uh, benefit the innovators, uh, that's going to help the innovators if you, if you allow for free markets, if you allow for property rights and so on. That's, that's the best way to encourage innovation. Is, is that kind of uh, where you're going with that? Yeah, so, I mean, it can, there can be a range of incentives. So that might be it with regards to intellectual property. With regards to institutions, a lot of the work that's come beyond that will say it's about the incentives, um, it's about the costs of the, the people trying to gather wealth, people trying to invest in new inventions are going to face. And right. if, you, if you reduce those costs, if you reduce transaction costs, if you make things easier for inventors, you're just going to get more inventors. Mm -hmm. Ordinary people invent more. And the same underlies ideas like you know, um, learning by doing. Mm -hmm. right? This idea that let's just have a bunch of industries, people will get better at it, and that, that kind of betterment will just get better and better over time. So actually, you know, the reason I talk about the improvement mentality is I actually don't think that's true. 
Mm. Um, and actually, I, and to give me one more example while I'm sure. in that vein, yeah. you know, if you look at Bob Allen's work on incentives to innovate, he kind of says basically every society has had people inventing. It's just that the, the, the factors of production or that the costs of the relative costs of things like wages or of labor and of energy or capital uh, meant that in Britain you had more uh, labor saving invention, whereas in China you had more land and other kinds of factor saving inventions. Right? There's not this idea that actually, regardless of, of the cost, regardless of the incentives, that there may be cases where people just don't even think to innovate in the first place. Mm. So my favorite way to, 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 to come at this problem is to say that popularly you hear the phrase that necessity is the mother of invention. And I just don't think that's true, right? It's that actually you can have necessity and the usual response to necessity is that people just tighten their, their belts or they die or you know, something terrible happens. The idea that you can come up with a, a, a creative way around a problem is actually a very different and often a very rare way of looking at the world. So um, there's something... You know, is is there something about unique about England in, in that sense then? Because what you're saying is that essentially other countries, and Bob Allen might be saying this too, is that other countries had these incentives, but Britain somehow had this improving mindset that was different from the rest of, say, continental Europe. Or, or is, is that correct? Not quite. Okay. I actually think the improving mentality yeah. has probably emerged in many different places, in many different periods. Um, you know, it's the kind of spread of um, this mentality from person to person, mm -hmm. right? I identified it for my, my, my um, group of you know, just under 1,500, a mm -hmm. sample of just under 1,500 inventors, um, but also even just looking at a few other inventors from other efflorescences, other bubblings up of economic growth and innovation, it seems as though you, you probably see something similar in Renaissance Italy, you probably see something similar in the Dutch Golden Age, um, the same when it comes to uh, people from the Islamic Golden Age. I suspect you get these little hubs forming, you get this kind of the improved mentality from time to time in lots of different places. What makes Britain special is that, it, is that British inventors, I think, were particularly good at spreading it. Right, so it's not so much that Britain had a mentality. I don't like these broad sweeping cultural claims. It's that British inventors were especially good at developing the institutions or changing existing institutions so as to better spread it. So if we think of it as a bit like, um, I guess it's a bit controversial to use it right now, but I always used to use the analogy of a virus. Right? And I guess now I can put it into people who understand even better, which is that in Britain, they raised the R0 quite significantly. They made it much right. more viral than it had been before. Um, and so a lot of my work right now, and the reason I keep filling my book, actually, is that I keep doing more work trying to unpick exactly what kind of changes to institutions the British inventors lobbying for um, and how are they doing it. See, and one way to put this again is that Britain gets very good at taking institutions from other countries. It rarely actually invents them itself, which kind of comes back to the, what, the, 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 the reputation that Britain has by 1700, which is that if you want something great, you want it to be invented somewhere else, mm -hmm. probably France, and then perfected in Britain. And it seems to do that with the institutions that inventors are creating just as much mm -hmm. as it does it with the um, inventions themselves. Right. So to give you a few examples of that, the Royal yeah. Society. I mean, I, I need to look into this a bit further, but my, my very strong hunch, and I seem to be finding more and more evidence of this, my very strong hunch here is that actually it's based on a, an older Italian institution, which barely lasted a few years. But Brit, the, the Brits, it seems, were very good, or you know, a lot of immigrants as well, but people in Britain were very good at creating a, a, an institution that would actually last hundreds of years rather than just a few years and would be able to continue reforms. So the same with the Society of Arts in the 1750s. It's based on two um, French precursors, none of which last all that long, as well as a, a Scottish precursor, which doesn't last very long, as well as a, a, um, an Irish precursor, which has actually lasted, um, but is like a kind of exceptional um, in, in, in that way. Now the Royal Dublin Society. Um, so again and again, there are these cases where institutional forms or particular um, types of bottom-up institution, as well as you know, lobbying for, for, for the elites to implement certain kinds of certain methods, certain institutional forms in Britain, it almost always comes from abroad. Even the same with the patent system, mm. right? I'm finding more and more evidence right now that the patent system, as we conceive of it today, um, seems to come originally from Italy. Um, that it's actually initially proposed by a bunch of Venetian inventors, as well as a few others. Um, and it's only eventually adopted in Britain. 
Um, and actually, what's very striking about the early patent system in the mid 16th century is so much of it is about getting talent from abroad. So it seems to be this response by those in power to say, okay, well, we've tried it out in this way, let's try it again. The same with various corporate forms, right? Nearly all of the, you know, I think the problem is there's, there's such over, there's so much work that's been done on, on, on British history that we sometimes think that Britain was first at doing some of these things, right. uh, like the kind of a corporation as we now kind of in a broad sense think of it. But actually these, these are often proposed from abroad and then adopted in Britain. Um, and then they find the, they find their legs. Can, um, can I backtrack a little bit? Can I just ask yeah. you about the improving mentality in a concrete sense? If I'm an inventor or a potential inventor, the improving mentality would, uh, I guess, impel me to look at an object and say, how can I improve that? You know, there's, there's a mindset. And pre, prior to that, I would just, you know, it wouldn't even occur to me to think that, oh, I could improve this process or I could, I could do it in this way. Is that is that yeah. correct? Is that a fair I think statement? That's right, and that's yeah. so that's that's what I've kind of gathered from the way that inventors speak about invention themselves in this period. Right, so it's kind of it's almost like there's, there's a sort of dissatisfaction with the way that things are. Um, so for seeing room for improvement is basically saying the way things are is not great and could be better. Um, mm. So yeah, I. I guess that's you know most people most of the time are just kind of satisfied with the way things are and you know if things are hard they're like oh well it's you know life is hard and so i'm just going to continue yeah. um, doing things the way i've always done them um to actually optimize all the time is i think a very rare thing that's maybe another way of putting it is mm -hmm. these are optimizers and sometimes it's debilitating some of them are optimizers so much so that they never actually finish any of their inventions <laughs> Uh, interesting. So, so your database, um, your 1500 people database includes people who both tried and failed and actually tried and succeeded in a sense. I've tried to capture as many of those who are trying and failing as much mm -hmm. as those who are trying and succeeding. Right. Um, I think it's, it's a mistake to focus too much on just the, on just the successes. Um, yeah. Because that doesn't really tell us much about invention in a broad sense in Britain as a whole. It just tells us, it may just tell us what makes an inventor successful and I think those are two very different things um, commercial acumen business acumen is very different from invention um, so you know Richard Arkwright or James Watt may have made huge 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 fortunes from from their inventions um, but actually the vast I mean a lot of them don't do all that well I know there's some recent work by Sean Bottomley who looks at a pretty large sample and finds that on average they seem to do better than the population as a whole um, in terms of making money. It's not clear how much of money actually comes from the inventions themselves. Mm -hmm. It's a very difficult thing to work out anyway. Um, he was looking at how much they were dying with, so using evidence from their wills. Um, the problem with that is that often inventors are actually just rich people anyway. They're using, using their wealth um, to do the improvement stuff, uh, which I is see. actually separate from their day-to-day. -day. Um, you know, they might be a lawyer, you've got a lot of clergymen, you've got a lot of gentlemen, who aren't actually commercializing things at all. Um, so it's difficult to say how successful they are. And obviously, with, even with my sample, although it's the largest one that's been done in such detail, um, even then, you know, I'm still finding names. I'm like, maybe I should consider trying to add, mm. trying to expand it even further because it's difficult to capture all of them. So were these people well-educated in general? You can point to examples of people like Bessemer, who I don't think was a particularly well-educated guy. But in general, like if you look at your sample, were they well-educated? Did they have some knowledge of the scientific method? Did they know about the, you know, the latest scientific developments in, in France and Germany or you know, Prussia, I guess it would have been at that time, or Switzerland? Did, did they have any, uh, you know, background in in reading and writing or or letters or so on so in general i think they are pretty well educated um they're certainly i don't think i can't think of a single case where they would have been illiterate mm -hmm. um, i know some people might say i think john brindley occasionally you see the idea that he wasn't that literate um but that just meant that his spelling wasn't very good and that was you know, pretty much everyone so you know yeah. um and he was definitely very skilled in mathematics and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure he knew euclid's geometry pretty well so you know on the whole they definitely have education um and bessemer certainly is very well educated he certainly had schooling there's a difference between their educated kind of general sense and they have kind of basic 
basic level of skill like literacy and whether or not they're actually skilled in the inventions that they're doing. Right? Because one of the things that I found was that you know, a lot of these inventors are applying the improving mentality to multiple things. They're not just a skilled person who's getting better at doing the skill that they already have. Right? I don't think this is just learning by doing or that certain, you know, maybe certain skills are better than others in terms of promoting invention because they give you capabilities in a broader set of domains like engineering or mechanics or being a millwright. I see these inventors simply applying it to things that are completely unrelated to the things they have experience of. So Bessemer is a great example of this because he's famous for his improvements to steel making. But when he was doing the steel making stuff, he actually kind of admits in his own autobiography, I, I basically knew nothing about it. And what that meant was I made loads of costly experiments, but I was trying out a lot of the stuff he comes across with the invention. Um, as, he, as he himself puts it, he had nothing to unlearn. Um, so in some cases it can be an advantage I would but I would go so far so far as to say that you know that to be an inventor you should be ignorant um, but rather that you know, to be an inventor they didn't have to be experts in the domain take Edmund Cartwright right this is a guy who uh, mechanizes uh, weaving mechanizes the loom um, he's just a clergyman he doesn't know anything mm. about uh, mechanics to actually get the mechanical stuff done he needs to outsource that to someone who can build his design but being an inventor isn't, isn't about necessarily being a part of the entire process of design. And actually, he has a lot of trouble because although he takes it to Manchester Mechanics, they don't even bother working on it because they think it's just some kind of crazy clergyman who's come with a silly idea that will never work in practice. <laughs> and he has to keep coming back to them, trying to persuade them to actually do it. It's like, build this damn thing. That's hilarious. <laughs> That's hilarious. I... Um... I have to ask, you know, this period of time, this uh, this period of innovation that you look at in, in the book uh, from about the 16th to the 19th century coincides uh, with the uh, part of history we know as the scientific revolution, which is the adoption of the scientific method. You have people like Descartes, you have people like Isaac Newton coming out and, and saying, you know, we can actually study nature using this method and using uh, a certain... Uh, way of, of organizing our observations and to make theories about them. Does the scientific revolution have an impact on these innovators and their mindset? Does it actually uh, cause, is there a causal link between the scientific revolution and the improving mindset as you've defined it? I'm not sure I like the term scientific revolution. Mm -hmm. I haven't, uh, it's just like industrial revolution. Just like the it's industrial revolution. Yeah. Yeah, uh, everyone who writes on science, either you're David Wooten, you can put together this extremely well footnoted um, mm -hmm. tome to try and support the idea of a scientific revolution. Or, you know, most people, I, I mean, I've, I'm still undecided about the term. Here's the way I like to think about it, is that in many ways, what we call the scientific revolution is, I think, about mathematicians trying to make themselves more prominent and in many ways succeeding in doing so. And so kind of bringing sort of systematizing mindset when it comes to, to knowledge and, and especially useful knowledge. Um, so to the, to the extent that that happens, I think, yes, it is very important. I think some of the, if you look, go back to the 1540s and even earlier, a lot of the very early improvements that take place that allow Britain to become um, commercially successful and then violently successful, creating colonies and and expanding an empire, um, nearly all of them have their roots in mathematics. So that's applied to shipbuilding with people like Matthew Baker coming and revolutionizing the whole process of shipbuilding, which used to be you'd literally build it, you, you kind of, you do the design in, in the wood itself, right? So you kind of build full scale wooden molds for the hull shape, and then you would build around those molds, and then you would kind of, you know, you copy the old molds you'd use, which you knew worked, and so you kind of any change you'd make, you'd have to actually do at scale, at the full scale. Right? So in terms of designing new things, applying mathematics, you know, basic geom really basic geometry. This is like Euclidean stuff, right? Goes mm -hmm. right back to the ancient world, but for a long time being kind of not lost as such, but kind of not really available, especially beyond the Latin speaking um, um, literati. So mm -hmm. as Euclid's elements get more and more available, you start to see in shipbuilding where Baker, for example, takes shipbuilding out of or the ship design out of the actual shipyard and onto paper where you can start creating blueprints and you know with pretty good precision how it's going to turn out when you actually start to build the thing. The same with navigation. You know, it's an astonishing thing to think that Britain in the 1540s has hardly any sailors 
who can't just hug coastlines. So they're very experienced mariners in the sense that they'll know, you know, when I'm, they'll know how to recognize a particular coast. So you have experience, but you can't use a compass uh, particularly uh, successfully, and you certainly can't use what we now call the kind of basic stuff of celestial navigation, being able to use the stars to orient yourselves. And that, again, that requires some understanding of mathematics to start coming up with improvements to, to navigational instruments, um, new, new quadrants, uh, um, new kinds of uh, observational instruments as well. And so a lot of the, a lot of the mathemati mathematization of it actually allows Britain to become a seafaring nation, whereas traditionally mm. it was still very much, you know, its reputation was for violent soldiers who are pretty good. You know, they're, they're, they don't necessarily conceive of the, the, the sea around them as being a defense because, you know, they've still got land in, in, in the north of France around Calais. Um, it's only after the loss of Calais, and it's only with that mathematization that Britain starts to see the sea as a first line of defense rather than a highway for invaders, which it traditionally had been. I'd like to take a step back and ask again about this improving mindset. You argue that there was in Britain a unique need to evangelize this mindset among, I guess, the general population in a sense. And you've given some examples like the Royal Society and, and so on. Um, is there any other evidence you can point to? I mean, it's, it sounds like to me, it sounds like to me like this is the early uh, dawn of some kind of evangelizing religion in a way. Is, is that fair to say? I think so, yeah. yeah. So in, in many ways, you know, it's, you don't, you, we shouldn't just be looking at the inventors. We need to be looking at their cheerleaders. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of people who are getting obsessed with using invention as a policy tool, right? This whole idea that we can make Britain rich by you know, inventing its way to riches rather than conquering its way to riches. Or actually, you know, they often argue, let's do a bit of both. You know, let's do some inventions and then use those inventions to conquer people a bit better sure. <laughs> uh, or more efficiently, right? You know, I think, you know, that the roots of, you know, it's no accident that the term British Empire is, is I think, first used by John Dee. You know, this is mm -hmm. a person who's saying we can get wealth. We can get wealth by exploiting Britain's position as a potential place for navigation. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, a lot of them mistakenly think that there's going to be a shortcut to the East Indies, um, to you know, the, the, to like Indonesia and and China and 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 India, um, uh, a northwestern or a northeastern passage. They didn't realize at the time that they couldn't go that way. So a lot of the effort is expended trying to find those routes. But in the process, they get very good at doing global navigation, right? You go from Britain in the 1540s being barely able to depart from the coastline um, to by the 1570s, having people like Francis Drake circumnavigate, doing, I think, the second of the, the, the world's circumnavigations. Well, after, is it fair to say that this, person, in, this improving true. mentality is not just uh, about innovation, but also exploration then? It's, it seems like that's what you're suggesting here. Yeah, I think I think in the early period, at least, exploration mm -hmm. is intimately tied um, with the improved mentality, at least in terms of how they how they how they're trying to address it. So a lot of it is to do with generation of inventors in Britain, the current political situation, try and get princely and and just general elite patronage support for their work. So in the 1540s, a lot of that involves let's let's have voyages of exploration so we can open new trade routes because at the moment the Habsburg Emperor, you know, isn't isn't letting us trade with with main with much of mainland Europe. Um, or there are you know the general diplomatic isolation of being a Protestant nation um, mm -hmm. in a predominantly Catholic uh, continent. Right. So that they'll they'll use crises to try and get something out of it. Uh, again, something very different from necessity being the mother invention. These inventors had already been around, but they get much better at tailoring, um, much better at lobbying, effectively, cementing that power um, decade after decade after decade throughout this entire period. That's why I think Britain doesn't just end up petering out as an efflorescence, just like Renaissance Italy, just like Dutch Republic. Um, and I think a lot of that is probably to do with institution building from the bottom up, which is that they get very good at creating sources of, um, spreading the improving mentality, sources of networks or kind of institutions like the Royal Society, institutions like the Society of Arts, meet regular meeting places for themselves, um, sometimes informal, sometimes more formal like the ones I just mentioned, which don't rely on just having the ruler just giving you a bunch of money and supporting mm -hmm. you. 
And I think what then happens is that if you happen to have a ruler who's not interested, or you happen to have political elites who kind of like, eh, invention's kind of boring now, unlike what happens in the rest of Europe, you continue to have inventors kind of being inspired to, to invent for the first time in Britain because it, 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 is, it isn't dependent. The great thing about the Royal Society is that the king never actually bothers to give it any money in the end. Right? He gives it the name, <laughs> but he doesn't actually give it the patronage. So they're forced to find ways that where they, they kind of get subscriptions from, from the mass of, a mass of people rather than the other way around. The Society of Arts as, as well. Ah, you know, it's a subscription-funded funded institution. Right? It's actually a de deliberative direct democracy. Mm. Um, and through having that very broad base of subscriptions rather than being dependent on the individual patrons, um, I think that's why Britain kind of takes off, or, or at least is, isn't as fragile as a system um, when it comes to promoting invention. Otherwise, you end up being like, you know, Renaissance Italy might get, give, have the Medicis or the Sforza or a particular doge who loves innovation, but the moment you don't have someone who's that in favor of it, then you're kind of screwed. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, Britain actually has a bunch of kings who basically aren't interested in invention for, a whole, for, for quite a while. You know, George I and George II barely care about the arts. They maybe love Handel, um, but otherwise <laughs> they're interested in hunting and chasing women. You know, that yeah. George III is, is completely different, so he ends up promoting the arts. The, reason, the Royal Academy of Arts is set up under, under his tenure. Um, but what it meant is that even in that early period, in the, in the early 18th century, up, right up until 1760, you've got innovation improvements spreading throughout the country, more and more people taking up that mentality. So you mentioned John Dee before. John Dee is this guy who, in some ways, I guess, he's the one who first suggested the idea of British Empire. So you might call him the architect of British Empire. And uh, in your, uh, your pracy, I suppose, on, on your upcoming book, you mentioned that he was uh, Queen Elizabeth's astrologer and a known occultist. And he, uh, in some ways, was the origin of the innovation revolution in England, at least in some, in some sense, or at least he was part of those origins. Uh, and I'm not asking now uh, in terms of conspiracy theories. I'm not asking in terms of Illuminati or any of that. I'm just asking a, a very simple question. And that is, do the origins of the improving mentality in England have an occult essence or an occult background to them? Like, was John Dee influenced by his occultic uh, practices uh, to say, oh, you know, we can improve these things? So that's a very interesting question. Um, because I know that occult and, you know, and had some overlap with, with innovation, right? Alchemy, of course, was this idea that we can turn uh, common metals into gold or into any other kind of precious metal. So, so ostensibly, there's kind of an improving mindset within that element of the occult. I, I, I'm just asking whether John Dee might have been uh, influenced by that and by his alchemy for example. So Dee's definitely amongst the early inventors, um, early innovators, um, definitely as a conduit for innovations. Mm -hmm. um, he's definitely not the earliest. I mean, there are other mathematicians who are doing improvements, people like Leonard Diggs, um, people like Robert Record, another mathematician. They're already around. You've certainly got a bunch of explorers who are pushing for the application of celestial navigation to opening up new new trade routes um, to much further places, much further afield. The interesting thing about this question, I guess, is that what we now consider occult would some of these beliefs at the time would be considered just part of science, hmm. right? Which is that you know, alchemy is pretty reasonable a belief to have at the time, given what people, even very educated people, even people who had lots of experience of metals and so on new um so you know when you see that the veins of a of ore seem to kind of proceed like tree roots you know through the ground it's a pretty reasonable belief that oh maybe these things grow just like organic matter does um which is one of the beliefs that a lot of alchemists had and that a lot of alchemy is just about speeding up that process and also there are actually quite a few cases where um what would what would seem to be alchemy actually worked in the sense that empirically you know not because they didn't quite understand why it worked certain experiments would actually appear to work um so a great example of this is from the 50 i think it's from the 1570s a guy called william medley in he sets up a 
with with a, a lot of official support, he sets up a essentially he he claims to be able to turn iron into copper, and people are sent to have a look at his works, and they come away saying it works. He seems to actually mm. be create, turning iron into copper, um, and the reason it worked was because the water he was using in the process was very rich in various copper compounds okay. and so in the process of processing yeah. using that particular water from that particular area right he actually does manage to appear to turn iron into copper mm -hmm. and so it actually works right that's that's the key thing is that you know i think it's a mistake to think that something like the scientific revolution or, or whatever is about the kind of newfound respect for facts that's not at all the case because actually the empirics almost always pointed in favor of theories like alchemy, uh, sometimes astrology, um, um, very often these kind of other now associated with occult beliefs, um, because they did actually work. Um, the same with a lot of the kind of very bizarre seeming medical um, beliefs is that actually, you know, a lot of the time when, it, when, these, when the solutions were put into practice for a reason that was kind of tangential to the original reason, uh, or to the reason they stated it, it seemed to work. I just have uh, a question about this historical study that you've done. You've already done a historical study on the Royal Society of Arts. You're doing this historical study on innovation. Is there a way that we can use policy or some other means to encourage this improving mindset in the general population today? Can Britain have a resurgence in this improving mentality or can Canada have this have a, an improving mentality? I'm not sure that we ever did have an improving mentality to begin with, but can that be transferred and can policy be used to encourage that improving mentality today? Yeah, I, I think definitely it can. And there's certainly some lessons that can be learned from the things that they were focusing on in the past. In many ways, I actually think you know, our ancestors of about 200 to 300 years ago were a bit wiser than us in trying to think mm -hmm. up ways in which to do this. For example, you know, a lot of innovation policy focuses on monetary incentives. There's very little in the way of focus on prestige or honor, mm -hmm. um, yeah. which at the time would have been extremely important. You know, the Society of Arts for its first 100 years in the 1750s to the 1850s gave prizes both cash and honorary medal prizes hmm. um, for non-patented inventions, trying to sort of complement the patent system. So if something was patented, cool. it meant they didn't need to bother doing that, but that there were other inventions that might still be very valuable to the public, you know, consumer safety improvements, worker safety improvements, and so on, not necessarily immediately profitable, all the sort that couldn't be patented because there were techniques in, in hmm. a certain way, uh, you know, different agricultural practices or semaphore systems, for example. Um, but Honor and, pr and your prestige plays a very large part in both the success of the society itself, because it kind of presents itself as being this public spirited endeavor rather than a for profit endeavor. So, you know, there's the, the attraction of becoming a, a subscriber is to have your name listed as a patron of the nation. I mean, I'd love to be able to pay in to then kind of have my name up there. So it's like, yeah. it's like <laughs> what donors to big universities pay to have their name plastered on a, on a room or some sure. step or some bench or whatever. Um, so those are really important. And also the fact that, you know, they had these medals meant that they could even incentivize aristocrats and, mm -hmm. and people who, you know, if, even if the cash prize they could put together wouldn't be um, sufficient to incentivize them, you know, these people are richer than creases, you know, you've, but you've, you can give an aristocrat a, a gold medal for something and they'll like, they'll really go at it to try and, <laughs> you know, get this medal awarded to them by someone who uh, rank higher than them or because they've heard that another person of a rank higher than them had won this medal before. So, you know, it's interesting, for example, that the honours system, you know, you've got in Britain, I assume that um, Canada is kind of has a similar, well, given you know, still have the Queen as the, as, yeah. as, as the sovereign, um, but, you know, the honours system rewards like, you know, it's for their charitable work and not for the actual inventive work that they've done. Um, so maybe there's a lesson in that in, in terms of either persuading the powers that be to try and kind of create honours systems or, or take honours systems seriously. But actually, I think, you know, implicit to your question is what can be done in terms of policy from the top mm -hmm. down. And actually, if there's a lesson in here, it's that actually you can do a lot yourself as an individual mm -hmm. in terms of organizing yourself into networks, creating more permanent network producing institutions, bottom up institutions yeah. that will then have a much longer term impact. Um, so the Society of Arts is set up by 
just a bunch of people, you know, it's 11 blokes met in a coffee house in, 11, in, 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 in 1754 and declared themselves the Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce. And then, you know, 266 years later, that institution is still going. Um, but, you know, there was nothing special about those people. They weren't the most influential. They certainly weren't the richest. They weren't the most inventive, but they happened to be the people who took the initiative. Um, and I think that's very important. It, because once you have those institutions, it then actually creates both a platform and then a network you can use to, to leverage the elites, the powers that be, the state or whatever, regulators, whatever, um, to actually do pro-innovation things. Yeah, what you say about a lot of this being done by people themselves, I think can be reflected today a lot in, say, open source uh, software, for example. You know, I, I, I'll give you an example. Uh, um, to do my research, a lot of it requires using GIS software, using statistics software. And maybe 10 years ago, that was all proprietary software you had to pay a lot of money for. Nowadays, you don't have to pay a cent for that kind of software. And I, you know, what else can explain that except this improving mindset among a subset of the population? Now, final question, Anton, where can we find you? You have a Twitter. I know you do. You have a blog. Tell us all about those. Okay, so my Twitter is just my name. It's at Anton Howes, all one word. Um, my blog is really, I guess it's a substack. It's an email newsletter, which also functions as a blog. So that's antonhowes.substack.com. Um, and which, you know, I kind of send a weekly-ish. I say it's weekly on there, but it's sometimes, you know, you end up down a research rabbit hole. And it's not quite there. But that'll be all about inventors, um, the Industrial Revolution, whatever it is that I'm researching. Uh, and then my book just out is, uh, I've got it right here, is Arts mm -hmm. and Minds, How the Royal Society of Arts Changed the Nation with Princeton University Press. And I've heard great things about that book. Uh, among the things that I've heard about it is that it's very well written, uh, you know, and it, it's, it's lovely to find something so well written. So, I mean, after uh, I've done this interview, I'm going to go get myself a copy as well. So thank you, Anton, for coming on my program. And I really appreciate it. You take care. Cool. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.